life. Yeah, that's great. I'll share my screen. Let me please let me know if it does uh, come up. Uh, you can see my screen, everyone. Yes, we can see it. Um, so unfortunately, I can't see the chat right now, but um, I can answer the questions later on. Mm -hmm. Or if you have questions, uh, um, you can uh, nod and you can ask the questions as well, because I have only one screen, so I can only see the PowerPoint only, not the chat screen. Um, anyway, thank you very much for, in, for the introduction. Um, again, once again, I'm Robin Tulader. I'm from James Cook University from College of Science and Engineering, and I'm a civil engineer. So. I teach into um, structural engineering side of it. Um, concrete engineering is my um, research area mostly. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the inter, uh, interactive digital books and how we can be transforming our, the traditional textbooks. So, uh, but I have to say that I'm not an expert um, in um, digital transformation or nor an expert in um, digital books, but what I want to do is more like a share uh, my experience with um, making a digital book. So hopefully uh, it can be useful for some of you. So it's more like sharing an experience rather than um, uh, I'm not an ex expert again. Um, uh, again, just a bit of background for myself, um, just my uh, journey itself. Um, I'm, I, I was born in Nepal. Uh, I was born and bred in Nepal. And I did my undergraduate in civil engineering from India. Um, and uh, completed my master's in structural engineering from Thailand. And I did my PhD in earthquake engineering in Japan. Um, then went down to New Zealand to um, do my, um, to, uh, I was a lecturer there for a year. And before the big earthquake happened in New Zealand, luckily I moved to Townsville. Um, so, uh, and I, I've been here for more than 11 years now. Um, so usually I, I put on this slide on my first lecture, for all of my lecture, I put on this slide, uh, mainly for two reasons. Um, because I'm from Townsville, so most of the uh, students here in Townsville um, may not have opportunity to go out of Townsville. So I, one of the reasons why I put it here is because I, to, to inspire them that uh, once they finish engineering, they are not limited to Townsville or not even Australia. They can travel all around the world and work anywhere. So just to inspire them that way to, by showing my journey itself. And uh, the second reason is to pretty much warn them of my funny accent um, because I've been living and working in so many different places. Um, so I, I don't know what kind of accent I have anymore. So I, it kind of mixed up everything like in the Nepali, Thai, Indian, Kiwi, a little bit of Japanese as well. So um, I'm putting it here again, just to warn you of my funny accent. So uh, if I'm going too fast or if you don't understand, please um, feel free to stop me and uh, raise your hand as well. Um, again, I put that my journey along with the technological development timeline here, uh, just to give you some context. Um, uh, so we know that uh, the moon landing, the first moon landing was in 1969. Uh, and I was born a few years after that. I wouldn't exactly say what year, just uh, I wouldn't divulge that secret. But um, just after a few years, I was born after moon landing. And when I was doing uh, my undergrad in India, um, the internet was still in its infancy. So um, we never had an access to internet when I was doing my undergrad. Um, there was internet, but um, the, the computer with the internet was pretty much locked in the vault, so we didn't have any access to it. Um, by 1997, there was a hotmail already there, um, but to send an email, I had to travel to the city um, and then a 30 minutes journey to send an email and come back again, so uh, it was not convenient. So we used to write letters um, and send it through snail mail to my parents, and it took almost a month for the letter to get arrive in Nepal. And to get their reply back, it took another one month as well. So two months um, of turnaround time when we write the letters, but it was fun as well. And only when I was in uh, doing masters in Thailand, um, the, the internet was already there. And um, the, if you re still remember that at the time there was MSN chat. Um, so that was a quite, quite a bit of change for me because I could chat in real time with my parents. So I stopped writing letters. It was much easier to com communicate with my parents. 
Um, and when I was doing PhD in Japan in, from 2003 to 2006, uh, Facebook came in at the time and YouTube came in as well. So again, it was getting much easier to communicate with my parents who would say photos, videos very easily as well. So uh, when the YouTube came 2005, I, I have been subscribed to the YouTube channel right from there itself. I was an early adapter in that sense. I had my own channel from there itself. But I was of the view that um, it will not take off um, because I was thinking that who would be interested to see other people's videos. Um, and I was thinking it, it just will not take off like Facebook. It will, it will, not, it will just die. But uh, and of course, I have been proven very wrong in that. Um, so um, now in 2007, I phone was introduced. I, wa I was going to New Zealand at the time and things completely changed from that point. Um, so. Um, with the smartphone, everything that um, the information, as we know, is in our fingertips and uh, how we do things have changed completely after that. And again, once again, I was proven wrong in 2012 when um, Apple introduced iPad. I was thinking that iPhone is already good. Um, who will be carrying this big sleds iPad around? Because they're just pretty much same as iPhone. And again, once again, I was proven very wrong as well because they were very... Uh, useful for study purpose, for uh, for office work, for meetings and everything. It is very used and everyone uses it quite often as well. So I've been proven wrong again and again about this technological development. Now, what why I put these two line, timelines together is because like, if we see it in this scale, it looks pretty long. So it's pretty much a lifetime for myself, 50 years, uh, 40, 50 years of uh, timeline. So uh, the technological development has taken quite long if it looks like if we see in this time scale. But to put things in perspective, if we put that into the scale of um, industrial, uh, industrial uh, revolution, we see that whatever I've talked so far is happened during this time, around 50 years time. The moon landing happened here, iPad was introduced here. So even if um, for our lifetime, it looks pretty long, but compared to the industrial civilization, what has happened is um, over a very short time, especially if we compare that the printing press was uh, invented in 15th century, steam engine was introduced in 18th century, telephone was introduced here. It took a very long time for the te technological development so far. But from here on, as you can see, um, the word processor were introduced here. Uh, MS-DOS was coming here, um, World Wide Web was here. and everything um, went on exponential curve from there on. So everything happened in a very, very fast pace. But the question is, um, this digital uh, transformation has impacted everywhere. So we know that, I mean, it has uh, disrupted how we download music, how we buy music. Um, it has disrupted how we watch movies, I mean, like in using Netflix or um, Amazon Prime. Um, how we buy things um, and how we travel as well. So it has pretty much disrupted everything, all aspects of our life. But if we look into the higher education sector, uh, we will agree that um, pretty much the universities and the higher education sector have fairly remained immune to this digital disruption so far. Um, and we haven't changed much. So um, when I was doing my undergrad, um, uh, yes, there was no PowerPoint at the time, but the teaching method hasn't changed drastically as to what I do now compared to what I was being taught before. Um, so uh, yes, we didn't have a PowerPoint, we didn't have a learning management system, uh, but that's about it. But um, other than that, the teaching method hasn't changed much of how we are teaching now or compared to what we are teaching 40 years or 30 years back. But how the students are learning has essentially changed a lot because the students who are coming to the universities are, were born somewhere here. So they were born amid the, this, uh, this disruption in the technology. So they are born into the internet generation and they are the digital natives. So they are very familiar with all the digital technologies. Um, they have the skills to adapt to these digital technologies, but are we using those? Um, um, the skills they already have, um, but we probably not. Um, we are pushing with the technology that we are familiar with rather than we are using the technologies that they are uh, familiar with or they have skills in. So kind of um, it's sad that uh, we are preparing the next generation for future jobs, but we ourselves, the academics, kind of often resist the chains um, 
as well ourselves. So that's kind of um, a bit sad to see that. Now, um, so this is the slide I have taken from the MIT program on uh, uh, design for digital transformation of organizations. So I did this short course a couple of months back. So this is the slide from there. What they say is that for digital transformation of any organization, these are the five key blocks that we need to develop. So one is operational backbone. We need to have a customer inside. We need to develop an accounting uh, framework. And, um, and then also only we can do the, we can work on the advanced digital uh, transformation, including the digital platform or having external developer platform. So I won't go into the detail here, but what we see is that what universities and academics are stuck here is pretty much in the first level only. University as such, uh, um, institution are, have done pretty much well in the operational backbone because uh, things like um, the student management systems, uh, finance systems, or uh, course um, database, they are pretty much digitized by now. So most of the university universities around the world have digitized them. We have a learning management system as well. So that way, universities have developed um, the operational backbone pretty solid on to, to get ready for the digital transformation. But that's pretty much in there. Um, um, the universities still don't have the good customer insights yet because our customers are students. We don't really care where they're coming from. What is the, what are their skills? We don't care that they are digital natives. Uh, we don't know what their aspirations are, what their skills are. We are pretty much pushing what we are good at rather than looking at what they are good at. So we are pretty universities are stuck here. Um, and to go into more uh, higher level of digital transformation, we have to get a customer insight and then we can go progress into the other steps. But now if you look into the academics, we even are not at this stage yet. Universities are good at this, but academics as we look at, we are probably not good at this as well because we heavily rely on the paper-based books, paper-based um, materials, and we really haven't digitized our teaching resources yet. So what one thing what is important for digital transformation is the digitization has to be done uh, for the resources before we can um, effectively do the digital transformation. But where we are stuck here is academics are here pretty much. So we, we haven't digitized our resources yet. So, and something unpredictable happened in 2020. Um, so the COVID came in 2019 and it really started impacting in 2020. Um, so all of us, everyone around the world was impacted, as we know, like we, uh, we were queuing up in office works to buy uh, the headphones and um, the webcams to, to, to work from home. And the, the, the people that were really struggling to adapt to this uh, new normal were the academics, because, um, because we are not used to this uh, uh, new normal before, we were not used to this um, working from home concept before. So really the academics were scrambling all around the world to, to develop and deliver the lectures online. Um, I know that some of the academics, uh, they never uh, you were used to put um, even the learning materials on learning management system, they, they, they really resisted that as well. But suddenly they had to deliver the course live online using Blackboard Collaborate or um, Zoom or any other platform. So that was a biggest digital transformation for them in their life. So that's a very step change. So, and um, luckily we all did it. So I think uh, we should pat on our back that we survived through it. Everyone did a very good job. Uh, one of the reason why we did well um, through this uh, transformation is because the students were very accommodating, I should say that they were very accommodating um, because they were digital natives. If you remember that they were, digital, they could adapt to this new normal very easily. They are very familiar with the tools. They could adapt it, and they they understand that and um, they understood that academics struggle to do the transformation. They cannot do as the students could do, but they were accommodating. So the transformation was not as difficult as we would otherwise imagine before. So. Do we think we have done what wasn't possible for the last 30, 40 years that to, to do the digital transformation of the education sectors in the last one year? Probably not. Um, so yes, we went online, we delivered the lectures online, but does that mean we have transformed, um, the, we have done the digital transformation of higher education? Probably not, because um, 
within a year, we realized that um, the online way of the Zoom university really doesn't work. Before I talk, talk on that one, I just want to mention that um, I was relatively uh, ready for um, the online lectures because I used to record YouTube videos um, long before that as well. Um, so I did have all the gears ready for um, for the online lecturing. So I, I have the good microphone. I have a Surface Pro where I can write as well. I have a good recording system. So I was ready for that, but uh, I, I could see many academics struggling as well because some of the academics were trying to write the mathematical equation using their mouse. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult to write a letter using a mouse, but let alone the whole, uh, whole equations or solve a big problem. So many were struggling, but again, we got through it. And by the way, so if um, someone is really serious, if you are really serious about online lecturing, I really recommend this um, microphone, Blue Yeti microphone, they are really good. Um, so it really have crisp sound, it's a USB condenser microphone. And also Surface Pro with the pen um, is a must if we are, or any any kind of tablet where we can write is, is a must if we are going, uh, going for online lecturing. But again, as I said, uh, we thought we did the digital transformation, but really, did we do that? What we really realized, uh, very soon we realized uh, coming to this year is that the Zoom universities are not really a sustainable mode of learning. So um, they are not very effective and they are not really sustainable as well. Uh, so what we have been doing so far last year is we are running a Zoom university is pretty much delivering the online lectures. Um, so the drawback is that we are moving from one didactic teaching mode to another didactic teaching mode uh, from online, uh, from the face to face teaching mode to online but the, essentially the delivery way is still the same it's a more one way delivery mode and even it's worse in the way that the interaction is very poor in um, the zoom university as i would call it um, um, usually um, the videos are turned off uh, like what we have right now in the session as well. So we uh, the uh, the lecturer cannot see um, see the students. So we don't know really what they are doing. Even they are um, understanding if they are joining out. We don't know really. So often the one of the biggest frustration I had last year was it felt like I was speaking to the wall um, all the time because there was no interaction at all. So the interaction was almost zero. They do ask a few questions, but for them also, it's asking questions was very difficult. So, so the, in the nutshell, what I mean is that, um, yes, we have delivered the online lectures, but we haven't really done the digital transformation. It is not a, a holistic transformation yet. So we have to uh, work further to that one. So, um, so the post COVID opportunities so post COVID, whenever it, it might be, but uh, the, it does create some opportunities or it does at least create some um, points that we should think over is that, um, just the online delivery is not the solution. Uh, we have to think of other ways of integrating more innovative mediums for learning and teaching as well. So that might be optimizing multiple delivery modes, just not online, but it, it can be face-to-face, -face, flip classroom, all those kind of things. We have to see what works best for the students and for the academics as well. Uh, so it, we have to explore these innovative mediums of learning and teaching uh, rather than focusing on just the online delivery. Yes, it re reduces the resources, but again, is it an effective mode of teaching? That's a big question. And um, also we need to see how we can expand the access of the learning resources as well. So even in the online mode, we are pretty much relying on the the paper-based textbook on at most what we do is we put our lecture notes in a PDF format or videos lecture recorded videos online, but that's about it. So we haven't really expanded our learning resources beyond that. So we need to look into what might be the holistic way of delivering uh, an effective um, online lecture or, or even face-to-face, -face, pretty much in the multi-delivery mode. How can we deliver the lecture in a multi-delivery um, mode? That's the big question now. And and post-COVID, that, that's the opportunity we have to uh, sit back and think about what we can do about it. Now, coming to that, um, so, so far what we have been relying so much at the universities or higher education has been relying so much is the paper-based textbook and education is fundamentally based on pa using paper-based textbook, but compared to more digital books or eBooks, um, they are costly. So they are very expensive. They are getting expensive and more expensive. I'll, I'll show that one later. And they are static. Um, so yes, it is fun to keep the books, um, but uh, we can annotate it on the books. It is quite fun on that way, but they are pretty much static. They are not non-interactive uh, books. 
And also it is very difficult to carry around as well. Uh, so we can't carry around the books uh, all the time. So that is the big, biggest drawback as well. And another limitation for the authors is that uh, their publishing is quite difficult as well. So you need to navigate through all the uh, publishing houses. You need to get their attention. Um, they won't publish unless they can see the market for it. So it is very difficult to navigate through the publishing houses as well. And of course, because of the cost and uh, difficult to um, carry around, it has a limited reach as well. So that these are the basic um, weakness of the traditional textbook. Yes, um, they will always be there. They will not go away, but um, the digital transformation of textbook is inevitable as well. It, it's already happened in uh, in the other kind of books like fiction or non-fiction book. Um, we already have a digital copies of most of the books, but in the textbook, we still don't see that yet. So we don't see the uh, digital uh, books yet. Um, talking about the price, this is the data I see for the US from Bureau of Labor Statics. And it's quite interesting. This is the same timeline I talked about from the moon landing to uh, almost present like 2015. Uh, as you can see, the prices of textbook has increased almost 1000%. Per and that is much, much higher. Like it's three times higher than um, the increase in the consumer price index or the inflation is around 500%, but the textbook price increased by 1000%. So that is a drastic increase in the price of the textbook. And that's one of the reasons why students are not buying the textbook as they used to be before. Um, the increase in prices um, can mainly be because um, there are only four major textbook publishers around the world and they, they take 80% of the market pretty much. So they have the kind of monopoly in that. So, um, so that's one reason why it is increasing as well. And second reason is that, um, as the, the report said, uh, um, we as academics, we prescribe the textbook pretty much like how the doctors prescribe the medicine. So when we go to the doctors, the doctor will prescribe the medicine and the patient as consumers, we don't have any choice. We go to the pharmacy, we buy the medicine that the doctors prescribe. We don't argue with the doctor or we don't argue with the pharmacy to give us another choice or we just buy it. And, and, and again, the price we have to pay, whatever it is, we pay for it. Same thing is happening in the textbook as well. The doctors are us the academics. So we prescribe the textbooks and the students as, consum uh, as consumers, they don't have any choice. They have to buy those textbooks. So they, they don't have any alternative. So pretty much the publisher can put any price. So if the popular book, they can put pre pretty much the price and the students have no other choice than to buy it. But things shouldn't be like that. They, the students should have options to choose different books and the books should be more uh, affordable as well. So that is the big question as well. Um, and the publisher, these four publishers, have already started to realize that uh, the paper-based textbook doesn't have much future, doesn't have long future now. So they have already, as you know, they have already started this online digital copies or online subscription-based subscri 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 books, but it's not really reducing the cost of the books because they will add on the um, cost of um, online development. The students have to pay for uh, this online quizzes, um, access to the, um, the, 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 the materials online or slides. They have to pay for this one. And, and in total, actually, the price will be more than what you would pay for the textbook. So um, really, it, it's not uh, digital transformation in a way, but um, the publishers are doing that so that um, the students are still and academics are still hooked to their paper-based textbook. They're pretty much based on the paper-based textbook and we are still hooked to that system and uh, that ecosystem again. But it is quite interesting to note that um, the prices of textbook have increased so sharply, but, um, but how it translates to the revenue of, uh, to the authors, it is not increasing. In fact, it is decreasing quite sharply as well. So the authors are not getting the revenues um, that uh, that the, with the prices that are increasing. Um, we had published a book, uh, textbook um, in 2016, I think. Um, the, the revenue that we get from those books are pretty much uh, peanuts compared to the price of the textbook itself. Um, so, um, so one of the books I will mention it later as well. So we would in the US market, um, the textbook itself, the hard copy textbook, um, it is uh, the, the quarterly sale for, um, sale for that one was, if I remember correctly, was around $6,000 worth of this sold in three, four months. 
but the revenue that we got was hundred dollars. So it's peanuts compared to what they sell it. And this is not a very popular book. And now if you look at the very popular book, you can see how much they are earning from those textbooks. So it's quite different. So that's quite interesting as well. The authors are not getting uh, what uh, the percentage of the revenue are from the textbooks. Now, it's not just the cost that we are worried about as well. Um, so there are other aspects why we need to look into the digital transformation of the textbook. So, um, so this is the pictures I took from my recent visit to Brisbane. Um, we are building a new engineering building at James Cook University. So the university took us for a, a field visit at different uh, offices to show the modern office layout, how they are working. So, and I, I think maybe some of your universities have this setup already as well. Uh, we are very traditional so far, but we might be moving to this kind of setup. Um, I don't like it personally, but maybe we don't have any choice. Um, so this is from one of the consult engineering consulting company office, and they have this clean desk paper limit policy. That means uh, you have a hot desk. Um, so you come every morning, just bring your laptop, um, uh, put it on the dock and use the, use the screen. And when you leave, you have to leave your table clean. So there shouldn't be anything, no paper, no books, nothing on your left on your table. So pretty much on that line, what I was saying before was that to, to get to that digital transformation, first step would be to digitize as well. So if you are carrying around your books and papers, uh, that you can't survive in this digital world where you have you are you are forced to have a clean desk or paper limit. Again, is it the best way for the working environment? I don't know, but that's where the world is going uh, sadly for that, right? So um, for these engineers, what they get for each employee is this um, locker. So each employee gets this locker and that's where you can put your personal belongings. So you, don't, you won't be able to fit in hardly maybe five books in there and you have to put other things as well. So you can't carry your books around. There are engineering forms as well. So they, they would have to refer to the textbook. So the, that's the need of um, digitizing uh, the textbook and uh, digital transformation of the textbook as well. So you can't carry the textbook around anymore. Um, so one way is to scan the textbook. So, but that is not effective way. Again, scanning is pretty much putting the paper book onto the screen. That's pretty much, that's what it do, but it doesn't take into advantage, take advantage of the power of the digital platforms itself. It is still a boring, it is still a static. It just, we transform uh, the paper base to the screen. That's, uh, that's about it. And again, scanning is very uh, time consuming as well. So it's not a very effective way. Um, so far, what we have been doing is scanning pretty much like, uh, because we put the PDF format of our lecture notes on the, uh, on the learning management system. So that's about it, uh, what we are doing. So it is not really a digital using um, the, the power of the digital platforms like iPad or iPhone. We are not using it to the fullest advantage yet. Um, so now when, when it comes to the interactive digital books, it pretty much means the books that are accessible through any digital platform. It can be mobile, it can be iPad, it can be Surface Pro, it can be computers. We can access this book from anywhere. And more important, it has very rich multimedia content, like high resolution figures, videos, uh, infographics, uh, uh, and it can also, we can also embed quizzes um, and any assessment into the book as well. So it is a very high quality, um, high resolution books that have multimedia embedded in, into it. So it is very interactive. So they are what the digital books are. And it is of course easy to carry around. And one iPad can hold maybe 10,000 books. You can't carry more than five books around. So you can carry around the books very easily. And it can be very cheap as well because if the academics start publishing their own books, so they can pretty much uh, either um, make it available free or put it at a very minimum cost, say maybe $2 for a book um, instead of paying $100 for that book. Um, but you are scaling up. So maybe maybe uh, 10,000 people buy that book, $2 book compared to maybe 1,000 people buy that $100 book. So you are scaling up in that way. So you are making it very accessible and very cheap as well. So another door it opens is the self-publishing for the academics as well. So as I said before, right now the publishing is very difficult. We have to navigate through those four big publishers. Uh, we have to attract their interest first and also the publishing takes time and we have to meet their interests as well. So um, it does take time, but with the interactive digital books, we are pretty much uh, can be free to publish our own book as well. So that is another big advantage and it has ultimate ways as well. Anyone in the world can access your book. So that's a big advantage as well. 
Now, uh, from the knowledge retention perspective itself, so, so this is an inverted pyramid that, that most of you are familiar with. So um, when, what we say is that when we are when we are reading something, we get we retain around 10% of the information there. If we hear from someone else, we retain around 20% of what we hear. If we use audiovisual, probably 30% uh, we retain. And uh, the retention is goes higher and higher if we see someone demonstrating it or you participate in the group discussion, it increases much. And the best way of retention of knowledge is um, to do it yourself. Like in the tutorial workshop, if you work on it, you retain more. And if you, it's further imp important when uh, the students teach someone else to do something, they retain the knowledge quite substantially. So we are trying to climb up this inverted pyramid here. So from textbook is somewhere here. So we, we are re reading the thing, the, the uh, static book. But if we go into the audiovisual books with audiovisual, we are climbing at least three step up with the same books with more audiovisual. So we are using the uh, we are taking advance and days of the visual senses of the um, of the readers as well. So we are helping to retain more uh, information for them in that way. So this is where we are trying to achieve. Now, the beauty of self-publishing is, as I mentioned before, is that you don't have to navigate through the publishing houses. You can publish your book at any time and make it available on the platforms anytime as well. So there are mainly uh, these uh, few players that, that have to capture the biggest market in the self-publishing uh, one. So as you are familiar with the Amazon Kindle, so they have 80% of the ebooks market and but they are not very much specialized in the textbooks itself they are specialized in other types of books like novels and other book materials um, and Kobo again is very much uh, into other space as well so there is another one the Apple iBook I'm not sure how much you're familiar with uh, it, it captures around 10% of the ebook market and they are very good for textbook at least they have the potential for textbook and also there's are there are other players like will google playbooks and uh, other other things like i mentioned here now the beauty of these self-publishing platforms are there is that they're very easy to use it is pretty much like uh, using a uh, powerpoint or word so you can make a book in their format very easily and they have a platform where we can upload our book and sell it as well so they will be a retailer they will be a distributor as well and also uh, help us to um uh, proofread, not proofread, but they also help us to um, get a print ready book as well. So, um, so they, they, these platforms help us all, all the aspects of book, pub, book publication, what the book publisher would otherwise do. They will give us a platform to sell our books. They will um, give us a platform to um, distribute our books as well. So we don't have to worry about selling. We don't have to worry about the cost or anything. So they will handle that. So we pretty much have to develop a book and put it on a platform and they will take care of it. So there's a quite a bit of um, beauty in the self-publishing in that way. So we can do it. Um, we are not constrained by any public publishing houses in that matter. So I'll give you a quick um, um, demonstration of what uh, I did with uh, with my subject, uh, concrete engineering. Um, so this was a, this is a third year civil engineering subject. And um, if you're a civil engineer, you might know that concrete is fairly a boring material to teach. There is nothing interesting about it. So it's a gray material. Uh, so um, so one of the challenges that I had was pretty much captured by this paper big video I'm going to run. Um, let's see if it, can you hear the sound? Now yeah. it's bedtime. After daddy reads this story. It's not much of a story. Can you hear the sound? Yes, we can okay. hear it. Yeah, I'll, I'll play it on. Story, Peppa. Please read it, Daddy. Okay. <laughs> the wonderful world of concrete. Concrete is a construction material composed of sand, water, and chemical admixtures. Chapter 1. Sand. Peppa, George, and Mummy Pig have fallen asleep. So that is the pretty much challenge I had in teaching concrete. It's a fairly boring material, so I have to make it interesting. So that was what I was intending to do with this iBook as well. Um, now. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, the way I have used um, the, the pedagogical philosophy I have used is the twofold one. One is using the contextual teaching, bringing more practical examples so that they can see the context of how the concept that we have ta taught in the classroom uh, is used in the, uh, in the real, uh, real world. So I use lots of examples and a lot of, uh, lot of um, real life examples. And I use multisensory 
approach so that I use a lot of audio, audio visual uh, in my classrooms um, so that we can exploit the visual senses of the students as well. So whenever I go to the site or, or in an engineering form, I do take lots of photos and videos. So I have a, I have a, uh, I have a heaps of videos and photos that I can use. So that was a good thing for me because I have that resources with me. I use most of my photos all the time. Um, so the subject has been traveling pretty well. So there was no any incentive of introducing the iBook. It was traveling well. I introduced the iBook, I think in 2018 around, um, but, but improving this student feedback was not, of, not, not the motivation. What I want to say is that yeah, the feedback had been pretty good. So this is the, the orange line is the GSU average and the red one is my average in the subject. It has been pretty good. And uh, as you can see in 2020, this is the COVID one semester one, the subject did pretty well as well. Another thing I want to highlight is that student response rate in the surveys have been pretty good compared to average ASU rate as well. So we do online surveys as most of the universities do and the response rate for the online services most of the time is below 30%. So um, students participate, participating in the online service kind of reflect that they are engaged in the subject as well. So it, the participation rate has always been very high. Um, so my personal journey of the digital transformation was that I built the YouTube videos first um, in around 2013-14 because I was going for a holiday and I was uh, unable to capture uh, meet the few weeks of lecture so I had to put um, the videos online so I put the videos online and when I come back I realized that the videos, of course, my students watched it, but it was watched all around the world as well. So I was quite surprised. Now, uh, so this is the uh, today's statistics, um, uh, today's um, data here. So we can see that these videos have been watched, say, 94,000 times in India. So I was quite surprised that the videos I put in Australia here about my lecture materials have been watched almost 100,000 times in India. And that's equivalent. So the total time was is around 21,000 hours. So that's quite significant. So I was quite interested that the video, uh, the, there is quite interest from the students all around the world as well. So as I said, I always take my own photos and I always draw my uh, pictures for my lecture notes. And when what happened was when I was printing my lecture notes on a printer, uh, one of my senior colleague, uh, Professor Siva Kugan was there and he, he saw my lecture notes and he said, you have a very good lecture notes. Why don't we write a book out of it? So, what that was good. He has written more than ten books now. So he's he's a very good. Uh, he's a very proficient writer in that sense. So, um, so we collaborated with Siva and we produced a civil engineering materials textbook and it was published by Singes, one of the biggest publisher again. Um, so it was in a textbook. It it has been adopted as a textbook by US University. But but again, as I said, they sell quite a lot of copies of it. But the revenue that we get is quite small and it is still quite expensive for the students. It's more than $150 for to buy the new book. So not very accessible, not very um, uh, um, um, cheap for the students to buy it. So what I did was I used the material to transform into the interactive iBook, uh, which has more digital content, which is more interactive compared to the textbook. Uh, I'll show you, I'll give you a brief, brief uh, this, um, video demonstration of the iBook itself that, that I mentioned about. So I'll just play a small video here. So it uses very high quality videos.
Yeah, so that is a bit of um, demo demonstration of the book itself. So it has a very rich media content as well as embedded quizzes and everything as well. So again, we have I haven't fully exploited the capacity. There is a lot of um, um, potential on that book as well. Um, now, um, the, the limitation though is that it needs a Mac computer. Uh, it only works in the Apple ecosystem and some countries don't have uh, access to the iBooks itself. Um, so there are limitations though, but there are other uh, online platforms that I've been looking at as well. So like Google Playbooks, which works in the Android and Apple platform as well. It is pretty similarly easy to upload as well, but only thing is that it is pretty much static. It is not very interactive, but it is, it is fairly good as well in that way. So I'm looking at the other options in that way as well. So um, um, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation in that. Um, so we, we still have some time to discuss. I would love to hear from you and love to discuss, answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Rapam, for this interesting presentation. Um, uh, I just want to ask you, um, so uh, do you sell like this book to students, like uh, the one that you show just right now in that video? And uh, uh, if you do, how much do you charge for this? Yeah, actually, uh, these books, uh, what I put it online was it's only like $1.99, like most of the uh, apps and stuff like that. So it's $1. So I just put the very nominal price so that they kind of have the ownership of it. So anyone can buy it for $1. Um, I, I give the information to the students if they want to buy, they buy it as well. But for my students, the information is there on the lecture notes and everything as well. But most of them buy it as well, yeah. But it is really peanuts compared to my other book, which is $150. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, just uh, one more question uh, about this book. Um, do you know uh, how many people have like bought this one? Uh, is it only from Australia, maybe from different countries? Do you have any like numbers on this, um, like any statistics? So um, not not much really, but it it has been bought from US and Australia. So um, it is not so much, but still we have run it from maybe less than hundred so far. But um, because my class size is pretty small, um, but I'm promoting to see what we can do to get that more 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 access to other people as well maybe around 100 we have so but other textbook actually has been sold quite a lot uh, but again as you said the revenue we come get from there is very very low well Do thanks uh yeah uh nicholas yeah i would you like to ask yeah yeah would be good Robin, you uh, the question i have for you um is that uh you can your course how extensive is it it's not a complete concrete course, so I would imagine. So you're not designing, for example, concrete members. You're not. Mm -hmm. You're looking just at the material yeah. aspects of it. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Um, if, if so, it's only part of a bigger subject. I, I just like to get an idea of how how what sort of coverage you actually have yeah. in your ebook. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicholas. That's a good, interesting question. So, uh, yes, you are right. In the subject, uh, CS3001, we cover from the materials to design to pre-stressed concrete as well. Uh, so there are three sections, um, materials, uh, re reinforced concrete, and the pre-stressed concrete. So the ebook only co covers the, um, the material side, concrete material side of it. Why I did was because the material is the dry, dry portion. When it comes to design, it is very interactive. They do the workshop as well. So that's why my focus was on the materials. But again, it's not. I can do that for the second part as well. I have m most of the resources as well. That's my focus to develop for the design part as well. Uh, it, it can be a bit tedious to put the equation and everything, but it can be done. Uh, so it can be easily done as well. Uh, I did enjoy your inverted pyramid yeah. Where you showed that uh, learners learn by doing mostly. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering whether in your concrete subject, you could invite your students to make a small batch of concrete themselves. Yeah, they do. They it doesn't do. cost very much. Yeah, they, they do. I mean, at home, in the COVID situation, not at the uni. Um, they, they do, exactly. Yeah. They do. Um, so we have a oh. practical way. They, they build a concrete beam, three meter beam, and they break it as well. Uh, so even that, last, I don't believe they'll be breaking it at home. No, no, they don't. I'm staying at home. Ah, yeah. You know, because then you're talking ebooks and you're talking being able to use it away from a university. Ah, okay, yeah, right, yeah, I got situation. it. Situation. Yeah, I so got they it. They may not be able to break it. Yeah, uh, I maybe got it. They yeah. can at the university later on, yeah. but to at least mix it, um, know how to mix it, maybe trial a few cylinders. You can buy cylinders which are uh, disposable. Yeah, so just the pipe. Yeah, so it doesn't cost them it. much. 
you know, for, for, for less than $100. Yeah. Uh, okay. that they could make a, a concrete, um, a series of concrete cylinders and, and uh, perhaps have them tested later, or maybe even a beam. But um, uh, the, the thing is that I I'm trying to encourage the hands-on yeah. aspects because yeah, I'm a great believer in hands-on. That's a very good point, Nicholas. I hadn't thought, I misunderstood your question. Yes, that can be encouraged that they build that uh, concrete cylinder at home as well and probably bring it to test later on. So that's a very good point. Thank you for that. Pleasure. Um, I have a quick uh, question uh, okay, about, yeah. the, um, yes. about the book itself. So how much time it needs? Like if you have the material ready, how much time it takes to uh, sort of convert it to Apple format? Yeah. So. Uh, um, so the, the more time is required for actually having the content ready. So I would suggest that you have a con good content ready um, with you, otherwise it takes a long time. So if the content is ready, like in a Word format or PDF or PowerPoint format, uh, it doesn't take a long time. It is pretty much like making a PowerPoint slide from that, just put into the put into their format of, I, they, they have a, what we call as a iBook author. It is very user-friendly. Uh, Mac is very user-friendly. So it is very high in graphics as well. So um, you can do it very easily. But only thing is that if you are a Windows user, it takes a little bit time to get used to it. I, I'm a Windows user. So just operating the Mac took me some time. But after that, uh, it, it is like making a PowerPoint slide. Pretty much you just have, it, their iBook author is very, very good. No, thanks. And do they have any option like to prepare that book from Windows platform or it has to be from the Mac system? Yeah, so that is the limitation. So they need a Mac computer. Mac Luckily, computer. Um, mm -hmm. my wife is a IT engineer, so she has a Mac. So that was the easy for me. But yes, I, Mac is an expensive part of it. But again, iBook is one platform, but you can try Google Books, which is you can do it in any any platform. It is it will be like a PDF though, but yeah. but again accessible very much. It has broader access. Yeah. yeah sure. Thanks. Can I ask another question? I don't yeah, think others. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> I'll take the plunge. Um, I'm wondering how much time and effort was required to produce what you have done for what seems to be about a third of a subject. Mm -hmm. um, if, if people are looking at producing textbooks that cover more than just a, a topic within a bigger subject, but the, mm -hmm. the, the, the subject itself, it seems, seems it will be a daunting task. So it might be better, if, in my perception, um, to do what you're doing and, and you're looking within topics which together may be assembled to form a, yeah. a subject or a course delivery at a later stage. Um, but the effort is still there. And I think the effort is not so much in putting together the theory and the, uh, the standard stuff that you can find. And you, know, you don't have to think too much about that uh, because it's available, readily available mm -hmm. from normal textbooks. Where the effort would go is in the distinction between an, an iBook or, or an eBook or a, <clears throat> and uh, a standard textbook, and that is in the visual aspects of it and in the, um, well, visual, photography and videography. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be an academic, uh, still am involved in academia, uh, but I'm now more of a producer of, mm -hmm. um, if you like, teaching equipment and mm -hmm. teaching and facilitating teaching. Uh, I produced a three minute video commercially. Mm -hmm. So it's not me. So it's done properly. It's done by people who know what they're doing, uh, the correct lighting, uh, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I was able to produce this for um, the very low price of $5,000. Mm -hmm. So that's just one three minute video. Yeah. Uh, when you start putting a lot of videos together of high quality, Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you can have amateurish ones. Uh, like you said, you can go to a site and they're pouring concrete mm -hmm. and you show live action of concrete because that's mm -hmm. what you're showing. But if you're trying to show something else um, that's yeah. going to be convincing and has to be purpose done for you, mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be very expensive. So I think um, that's an aspect that is missing from re real textbooks or hard, co hard mm -hmm. copy textbooks because they don't have to venture into film and other, yeah. and other things like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. so um, 
yeah, so in principle, question. it should be less expensive um, to produce. Yeah, but whether so. it's on paper or not is another another question. Yeah. You can have a more static looking textbook, but you can refer within that textbook to links mm -hmm. which are in the public domain where you see some concrete pouring or you see something else. It doesn't belong to you, but it's in the public mm -hmm. domain. Yeah. So, um, so there are so, ways of doing it cheap, more yeah. cheaply. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, but to do something really well in terms of a, an iBook or an eBook, uh, the costs can be huge. Yeah, just, yeah, no, yeah. So to, to, to give you my perspective, um, so I have this first hand information of putting a similar book on uh, on the paper base as well. So it took us two years to produce that book. We had four writers uh, looking for different chapters. So it, it yes, we don't have to worry about the videos and stuff. But again, there still was quite a lot of work to bring the material together and stuff. With the with the iBook, yes, um, if we do really in high quality videos, it will be very costly. But the good thing is that most of the mobile phones are very high resolution right now. Um, so um, and also um, there will be more authentic if if we did just just amateur videos and amateur photos as well. So not it doesn't really have to be done in at the at, in the studio's uh, level of quality as well. Um, so most of the photo, I, what one thing what I do and I encourage all academic students, I take a lot of photos. So wherever I go, where I, wherever I see something interesting that I think that I can put in the books later on or put in the PowerPoint, I usually take video, photos of it. So I have heaps of photos and good uh, way of sorting it as well, so I can find when it is needed as well. So uh, probably we need to start taking photos, videos, and because um, copyright is another issue as well. So if you take photos and videos from other sources, you really have to, so Apple will not allow you to use other sources, even other book publishers don't, you need to get permission. And that's really messy it gets uh, when you have to get permission from other people and everything. So uh, it's really good to take um, your start to take. And again, a little bit amateur level is still okay, as long as it conveys the message. Uh, that would be my answer, I guess. Can I add um, to that just a little bit, and, and then somebody else can take over? Um, you said you had a similar book that you already published. Mm -hmm. Had you not had that similar book, I would say to you, I would think that you would be struggling to put an iBook together. Yeah. Because yeah. you started off with a great database, mm -hmm. uh, and all you were, well, I say all, it's still a very difficult thing to do. You're transforming that into an ebook. Yeah. So, so that's fantastic. Yeah. Had you not had that and you're starting afresh, mm -hmm. I think you would find the journey a lot harder. That's one thing. And if you didn't have, as you rightly point out, the uh, tenacity and the uh, forward thinking of let me take photographs everywhere I go, whenever I see anything that looks like engineering that might be useful to me, I'll take photographs and, and, and that sort of thing. And I've been doing that for a long time too, yeah. uh, but I haven't gotten anywhere near a textbook and anywhere near a, an ebook uh, for that's, an iBook that's, for that matter. Um, yeah, that is true. And even for the paper-based book, I think uh, taking those photographs is always helpful, very helpful actually, I found it. And um, yes, um, yes, having that book helped me a lot. But my point is that if you have a very good lecture notes, that's where you can start as well. Mm -hmm. Or a very good textbook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, Nicholas, for this interesting comments, and thanks, um, uh, Radman, for your presentation. I think we should um, conclude it because it's already 1 p.m. Uh, I just want to thank you one more time for your time and for this interesting talk. Um, hopefully, we would like now like um, go to um, uh, iBooks and like start uh, making uh, our own books and publish them. Yeah. Uh, I'll be uh, one of them because uh, I already have like two paper books and uh, I'm thinking how to like uh, turn them into iBooks. Yeah, so that's uh, for like cheaper, have, <laughs> for cheaper. Really, you should try it. <laughs> because you know, like those uh, paper books, they like cost like um, like more than hundred dollars, hundred fifty, hundred eighty dollars. Yeah. Like, and then if you like even like uh, make it like five or even like nine point nine nine dollars. Uh, you can still probably like sell more, but then you uh, won't sell as many books as like uh, uh, if you do it through like four major publishing houses because they will do marketing for you and everything, right? So no, but but but, but if, uh, the point is that if you go through Google, they are the biggest marketers, so they will put your book everywhere. <laughs> so okay, maybe yeah, maybe a Google uh, Play and then uh, also uh, Amazon. I think uh, Amazon, Amazon has also like something similar to iBooks, so I think they have 
like their own platform. So, well, uh, thanks again, and I will conclude the session. If you want to uh, hang around a bit uh, more, then uh, please, um, you can do that. But I'll just stop recording. Thanks.